Right, so a few weeks ago I asked you guys to ask me some questions with regards to precision rifle, hunting, whatever the case may be. If you had something on your mind you wanted to ask me, you had the chance. You guys asked some phenomenal questions and today I'm going to do my best to answer those. If you felt you asked a great question and you don't see a response in this video, chances are I'm going to do a complete video on your question for you because there's one or two questions that I'm certainly going to invest the time and actually do a video. Keep in mind we're having a baby now so you might have to wait a little bit for your answer. Anyway, without further ado, let's jump straight into the first question. Wait, we haven't hit the intro. So without a doubt, the question that I got asked the most is what do you do for work? What do you do when you're not shooting? And you guys liked a bunch of those questions. So I'm going to address that first. So I've actually been a financial advisor for the last 10 years now. It's something I do. I help clients secure their futures, retirement planning, investments. You want to take money offshore, a whole bunch of things. Anyway, this is not a financial advisor channel. This is a shooting channel. So let's move on to a shooting question. Having said that, if you've got some boring dude running your finances and you want to get things sorted out and you live in South Africa, Send me a DM on Facebook and I can maybe hook you up if you if, if you want. It's up to you or not. Whatever. Okay, cool. Okay, Johan Wesser asks, how often do you clean on 22? Some never clean due to accuracy issues after cleaning and others clean after every match. I have had the CZ455 for a few months now. I've got a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand rounds down it. Never cleaned it. Don't plan on cleaning it. Um, that is just something I heard. Maybe I can do some research on that and I can address this in the next time I do the 22 video because I've actually got a great connection that I can ask this question. What I have noticed with the 22 is when you switch brands of ammunition, I don't know if you guys have noticed on the 22 sometimes it's got this oily waxy thing on the actual lead. I have noticed that when you shoot different types of ammo it takes a few rounds to settle in but I haven't found the accuracy deteriorate as I've added onto the round count so I am not cleaning my 22 at the moment. I will wipe it down on the outside um, just to make sure it doesn't rust in the safe. Speaking of rust let me grab something. I want to show you guys something something new. So this week I bought this. This is uh, this. Not sponsored. Uh, I bought the portable dehumidifier um, on take a lot. And basically it's rechargeable so you can recharge it up, put it in your safe, it sucks out all the moisture. Once it's got a little indicator thing, tells you when it's full, you plug it back in, gets rid of all the moisture in there and then you can pop it back into your safe. Because I have noticed if you don't attend to your rifles and you're staying in a climate where it's humid or whatever, your house is super humid because your wife's plugging in the humidifier every day, every day. I don't want my rifles to rust so I picked up that 300 and something bucks got a couple of good rifles or any rifles probably a good investment uh, if I remember when I upload this link it down below next question Daniel Hayes asks have I ever hunted in New Zealand no I have not in fact I have never visited New Zealand I would very very much like to hunt a gigantic red stag in New Zealand so Daniel Hayes if you've got a connection for me to go shoot a big red stag in New Zealand Please get in touch. I'd really appreciate that. Super big bucket list thing for me. Shoot a big red stag. If you guys don't know what a red stag looks like, it looks like this. And it's awesome. Okay, uh, let's book a whole group trip to New Zealand. We can get some discount rates at my friend's travel agency. Okay, next question. Dagamore asks, any plans to move to six millimeter pole versus the 6.5 you're currently working with, like say six Creed or 606, definitely not the 606, but I am actually building a couple of six mils. I'm building the six Orpen, which I'm super excited about, modified 6.5 PRC case. We did some things with the body. We did some things with the shoulders. It's gonna be, it's gonna be something. Um, I'm also building a 6 Dasher. I was tempted to build the 6 GT, but uh, if you don't know what the GT is, new cartridge. But the thing is, when you stay in South Africa, I want something that I'm gonna be regularly be able to get brass for. Big, big, big plus for me. Um, but more on that later. But yeah, 6 molds, absolutely, I'm going that route. Bok asks, I know this is more of a sports shooting channel, in brackets, and I love that pump. Thanks for watching. Um, but if you can hunt any animal in Republic of South Africa, what would that be? I honestly would say I would hunt a kudu. 
any day of the week. Um, hunting kudu is such an awesome thing for me and if you've hunted a kudu before, I think you'll agree that that's, it's right up there. Like I actually have no desire to hunt dangerous game like lions and I would consider a buffalo dangerous game based on the other day's video. Um, which crushed it on Facebook by the way, like 200,000 views. <sighs> now if only one of my videos would freaking do that. Um, yeah, I'd pretty much hunt a kudu. I think it's a really difficult animal to hunt and it's a really satisfying animal to hunt and they are delicious. So uh, yeah, kudu. Um, next. Right, so, so this was a question that came up pretty often. I'm gonna put one example up here. Elkbo asks, how do you get stable with different shooting obstacles and positions? How you get stable on different shooting positions depends. First of all, you need the right shooting bag. I would say that would be starting point number one, especially if you're gonna be shooting over something unsupported. If you're trying to shoot something over something unsupported with no sort of, if you're doing hard on hard, in other words, you're doing like the wood of your rifle onto a, a metal barricade, you're, you're gonna struggle to get stable. So number one's gonna be getting a good solid shooting bag and I'm actually, I've got a shooting bag, comprehensive guide on shooting bags coming soon. It's filmed, it's edited, it's uploaded. I just have to click and then you guys will see it. Uh, so that would be number one. Number two, go check out my Patreon down below. $5 a month gets you in stage debriefs. I'm sitting on so many stages that I've formed over the last couple of years and I'm doing comprehensive feedback. I'm gonna put a little example here on a recent one I did. And the guys have really seen the value in that and uh, I hope you do too. So I hope to see you on that side. And for everybody else that asked that question. And by the way, the Patreon goes a long way to helping me produce videos like this one. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I'm way closer to the lens than usual. It's because we have a new lens and lenses cost money, even on sale like this one. And the guys supporting me on Patreon goes a long way to helping me do more content like that. So if you like the sort of stuff we're doing, maybe consider supporting the channel. It's so unfortunate to see big YouTube channels go away. Not that my channel's big, but that's my goal. But they go away because it's not financially viable. To give you guys some perspective, I make less than 300 Rand a month from uploading videos to YouTube. So I make no money from YouTube, essentially. Can't even buy like two Wacky Wednesdays. Right, so the next question is a brilliant question. It's from my friend Jacques, and Jacques asks, how do you get by the wife of all the gun purchases? Ha ha, I see what you're thinking. So the name of the game of sports shooting is consistency. So what you need to do is make sure your rifles consistently look like each other. So my strategy is quite simple. Vortex Optic, MDT chassis in FDE, and she's not the wiser. Hashtag don't tell Mare. Yeah, that's pretty much my strategy. The only time when she asks questions is if I lay them all out, like unpacking the safe or repacking things, she's going like, hmm, there's a suspiciously large number of bolt action rifles. So that's kind of the only time I have to deal with that. But for the most part, they all look the same. They're in the same chassis. So that makes my life a lot easier. So Nathan Powell asks a great question. My local ranges only go to 200 to 300 yards. Is there a good way to practice for longer shots at these ranges? For example, PRS stages are usually 450 to 800 yards. Could I get worthwhile practice in on shorter local ranges by just using one to two MOA size targets? I understand the wind judgment is a big factor in long shots. Would it be worth the ammo practice at these shorter local ranges? My short answer is yes, I absolutely think so. In fact, when I go out and train or practice, most of that is under 400 yards. And uh, the reason for that is I just make my target smaller. So same position, same time, I just make the target shorter as I bring the distance a little bit closer. Even nowadays, now that we've got the NRL 22 rolling in South Africa, I'm going out with my 22 and practicing at 92 yards. And I just make the targets like ridiculously small. And uh, that's a really solid way of practicing and that will translate, believe it or not, out to distance. If you can have a stable rifle and shoot a target this big at 100 yards, maybe this big at 100 yards with a 22 rimfire, it's going to translate to shooting a target this big at 600, 700 yards, trust me. Uh, I do find that the wind reading, at least my experience, it's, it's a very weird thing for me because I don't really 
know much about reading wind over distance. I basically just shoot on feel as I'm going through a stage. And oftentimes people would ask me after a stage, like, how did you read the wind? And I'm gonna, uh, I kind of don't know what I did there because I sort of shoot and then afterwards it like takes me a while to sort of debrief after a stage and realize what exactly it is I did there. So I would say 100% worth it to practice at shorter ranges. Just make sure you're doing good practice and the number one thing with going out and practicing or training is to go out with a plan. Don't just take a rifle and go shoot some targets. That's not good. So go out with a plan, work with the strategy. Today I want to work on improving my time it takes me to get my first round off I and set a timer on your phone or whatever the case may be and say right from the start signal I want to get my first round off from a prone position in under 15 seconds and then you can move that down to 12 seconds and 10 seconds and 8 seconds and it depends that's how you can keep pushing yourself but don't just go out and shoot I mean uh, that's not a great strategy so work a little plan it doesn't have to be super complicated something as basic as getting stable and getting your first round of a quality first round don't go with the point pull hope strategy which a lot of people do is like I'm sort of on target I'm gonna let one rip and hope it hits so go to the range with a strategy please so Hein Honecom asks Pete which focal plan do you use first I use first first focal or second focal seeing that you set your rifle on a set magnification for stages. I don't see the advantage of one over the other. In 90% of the cases, probably I never touch the magnification while on a stage, but I often do touch the magnification while on a stage on that odd chance that I need to. Now, the difference between first and second focal plane is on a first focal plane optic, when you change the magnification, the subtensions in your reticle on the wind hold or the elevation hold, they remain the same. The values do not change. On a second focal plane optic, as soon as you start cranking down on that magnification or cranking it up, the values are changing, okay? And that is very confusing. Now, I've shot a PRS match with the second focal plane reticle and it wasn't fun. I sucked. I came last. I don't think it was the reticle's fault, but it certainly did play a little part in how I, because I, at the time, I didn't realize that when I'm changing the magnification, I'm changing all the values. So yeah, that was a lesson learned from me. I subsequently changed to first focal plane scopes and I won't look back. Now you might say, wow, well, first focal planes are slightly more expensive. Yes, they are. They're harder to produce. And here's why I would buy a first focal plane scope. You can hunt with the first focal plane scope, especially if you're looking at something with the new floating dot like the EBR2C or the 7C, which is available even now in the PST Gen 2s. Spoiler alert, if you didn't know, those are coming pre-ordered down below. Um, you can hunt with that little dot. It's perfect on max magnification, even on 27 power on my new Razer 4.5 to 27. The hunt is the super, super fine aiming point. To give you an idea that that dot will cover two millimeters of your target. That's how small that little dot is. So first focal plane for hunting, absolutely fine. Yes, target shooting, absolutely fine. Feldskeet, absolutely fine. So you can pretty much do anything with the first focal plane scope, whereas if you wanna do our sport, like the National Rifle League, with the second focal plane scope, you're gonna be handicapped. You're gonna to have to shoot on the target, on this power setting that that scope was manufactured for to have the correct subtensions in the reticle, unless you're a genius at math. Um, it can be done, absolutely can be done. However, most of the time, that those reticle, the, the values in that reticle is only true at its max power. Now, when you're taking a sport optic, let's say this is your lens and I'm holding it here, I can see quite a bit. When you start cranking up on that power, that field of view starts doing this. Now that's fine if you're having to shoot one target, but as soon as you need to engage five, six different targets with looking through a little straw like this because you can't play with your magnification, that sort of becomes a problem and that might hinder you a little bit. Now, this problem can be resolved by looking at something like a Vortex throw lever. If you already own a PST Gen 2, maybe a second focal plane one, and the throw lever will give you access to your magnification ring without having to physically grip it, you can just manipulate it a little bit faster. So that's maybe a little cheaper workaround for you. I hope that answers your question. Great question, by the way. Simon asks, why did you choose the 6.5 Creedmoor over, let's say, the 260 Remington? Is it a personal preference or what are those personal factors? Uh, smiley face. Um, 
it's more like the 6.5 Creedmoor chose me, to be honest. Um, I saw a poster for a long range rifle match, started on YouTube, Googling the Ruger Precision Rifle had just come out. And we're sort of gonna dovetail two questions in one year, cause I get asked quite a bit, why did I bail on my Ruger Precision Rifle? So uh, first part of the question, I was reading about Caliber 308 versus 6.5 Creed at the time, and at the time, People were saying, oh, 308 till I die, you know. But the 6.5 Creedmoor is superior ballistically in almost every single way for the sport we're doing, okay? If you need to go into battle and shoot a flippin' AR-10, I would probably take the 308. Having said that, I chose the 6.5 Creedmoor and I've stuck with the cartridge simply because I've got brass, I've got dies, I've got everything for it and it's a wonderful cartridge, it serves me fine, I don't feel limited at all even competing against the guys with 6mm Creedmoors shooting 105 grain projectile at 3150 and I'm shooting at 2750 so they're way faster than me, I've never ever felt that that's hampered me in terms of competing in precision rifle matches so that's kind of why I stuck with the 6.5 Creedmoor ever since. And when I did my new custom bolt gun, I chambered it in the same cartridge. I wanted to do 6 mil, but I ended up not doing it. One, barrel life in South Africa is obviously a concern, uh, and a fast little 6 mil is gonna burn out your barrel way faster than a 6.5 Creed. I got 3,100 and something rounds out of my last barrel, and the last match I shot with it, I smoked everyone, and it was on point. So, yeah, there's an argument there for barrel life. Then, why I ditched my Ruger Precision Rifle. At the end of 2017, sort of midway, whew, just past the midway point of 2017, I realized I was going to shoot the Precision Rifle Series uh, finale in Oklahoma that year. And I had an opportunity to build a custom gun. I needed finance for that rifle, and so I sold my Ruger Precision Rifle. Somebody bought a great deal, because at the time you couldn't buy them in South Africa, there was no stock. And I actually chat with the guy who, buy, who bought my RPR quite a bit. He's loving it, it's still shooting great, it never hindered me. I just felt that I wanted to sort of take that next step, custom triggers, custom barrels, custom actions. And I haven't regretted that decision at all. I love my rifle. It's, there's something about the way my rifle, there's like, a, it's, it's indescribable. I've got like a relationship with my rifle. Uh, it's a little bit weird, but uh, it's, yeah, it, when I shoot it, it, it's like we're the same person. It's like an extension. And it sounds a little bit corny now, but trust me, when I'm behind my gun and I'm on a stage, I feel absolutely invincible. Even if the load's not great, I, I know that my rifle will do what I expect it to do, and I take confidence in my equipment. Uh, that it is right because I built it exactly how I wanted it and I know the level of detail that's gone into designing that rifle and manufacturing that rifle for me specifically. So yeah, that's basically why I ditched my Ruger Precision. There's absolutely nothing wrong with them. Mine shot great. I won a few matches with it. It was a wonderful rifle. I loved it. I miss it. Uh, I would buy another one. Absolutely. Without a doubt. I'd buy another Ruger Precision. What I, Knowing what I know now though, it is a little bit tricky if you want to sort of go into the rabbit hole of this sport. You will be limited later on if you want to explore options like chassis systems or accessories or stuff. You might feel a little bit limited on the Ruger platform. So that is kind of the other, I guess the only con with that is you're sort of limited to the Ruger Precision Rifle platform because you can't exactly take that barrel action out and put it into something new. Like let's say the MDT ACC chassis comes out and you're like, wow, this thing's awesome, I want that. You, you're gonna have to buy a new rifle. So that's the only negative. But it could also be a positive because then you would have two rifles. It's all about how you look at this thing. So the next question actually ties in really well with what we just said. Derek Warren asks, in your mind, is a custom action really worth the price over buying a factory gun and rebarreling it later? Yes, I believe so. My 6.5 Creed has been one of the best buys I've had not just with guns, with anything in my life. Um, I know it shoots really well, the attention to detail there is on another level. And uh, also what you gotta keep in mind is, custom action, yes, expensive, there are some more budget friendly options. You could look at something like a Remington 700 action and just blueprint that. Yeah, that's an option, but when, especially, I don't know where you're located, but in South Africa to rebarrel, it's a nightmare, so I would just off the bat maybe go custom if you can afford it. 
Um, there are some advantages other than just the custom action. Remember, with the custom action comes custom barrel. And you can spec that reamer way with way better tolerances and your custom throat, you can have it cut for the bullet you intend to shoot, which is super crucial. So there is this saying often with building guns, because you want to build the rifle around the bullet you're going to be shooting. Now that doesn't necessarily just mean six mil, that means specific bullet. So let's say it's 110 grain A tip, like I plan to shoot in my six orphan. Now the reason we want the actual bullet is we're going to design the reamer based on how deep that we want that bullet to sit in the case and we're going to cut that chamber for exactly how we want it. Then we can make custom dies if we really want to go there. But it just makes your life way easier. What I also have found with custom guns, they're way easier to load for. It'll basically shoot anything. Um, whereas I've done some load development for friends and on some of my Hawas, I own plenty Hawas, they're wonderful rifles, but they're way finickier when it comes to getting a good solid load, but it can absolutely be done. I'm doing it, my rifle, my Hawa shoots wonderful. I would take it to a match absolutely any day. Which brings us to our next question, which ties in with that. Gerard van der and asks, if you had to compete with a standard off the shelf rifle, would you still win or do good? Let's say Howard 65 Creedmoor stand, standard laminate stock and Vortex diamond back scope. Whew, the laminated stock, you're gonna get me with the laminated stock. Uh, I don't trust those things. They're super flexy and they're gonna have a point of impact shift, especially if you're shooting over a barricade or something like that. I was super tempted to go to a certain three letter acronym rifle series with my Howard 308 and shoot standard Norinco ammo, which is military surplus ammo. And I was going to try and win the match with that combination. I was just going to drop that into something like... This is the new RX chassis. I was going to drop it into that. Super budget friendly. I haven't, I believe it or not, I haven't had opened this box. I've had it for a week. Yeah. That's what I do for you guys. Because I want to get my reaction for the first time when I actually open this box. My wife's seen it. I filmed it. My friend's seen it. I filmed it. I've shown a few other people. Everyone's loved it. I haven't seen it. It's breaking my heart but I'm doing it for you anyway so that was kind of the plan I was gonna take standard Hauer drop it in a chassis diamondback tactical and go shoot a match and see if I can win I'm relatively confident that I probably would do really well but I think it's more about the individual skill than necessarily the rifle or the caliber because these matches aren't won at a thousand meters these matches are won between 400 and maybe 300 meters and 700 meters. That's where these matches are won. And it's not about long range specific caliber. This caliber is better than that caliber. Except for a super light bullet, like a 80 grain or something, a 223, I would say then the wind's gonna kick your ass. But I think you can do really well at a rifle match with a pretty stock rifle. I've actually done a video, if you haven't seen it, where I took my 50,000 Rand Razor off, put a Diamondback Tactical on and went to shoot a National Rifle League match against the best shooters in the country. I dropped the ball there on one stage, but I still finished in second in that match, one point behind the leader. So the Diamondback is certainly not going to be a limiting factor for you. Right, our next question comes from a pretty big YouTube channel, West Desert Shooter. Uh, he asks, do you dial or hold for wind and why? So I actually hold for wind always just because I have seen so many shooters very good shooters dial their windage the wrong way and zero a stage I've seen that happen so many times it's frightening so I hold wind because of that I will maybe dial for wind if I've got one target it's a prone shot at 1.3 kilometers or like 1400 yards then I'll probably dial wind but for the most part if we're shooting barricades I wouldn't dial. The other place I would dial wind is on a mover. I would dial the wind for the move and then I could just hold for the lead on the mover if that makes sense if you guys have shot a mover before. So that's the only two times I will dial for wind. Other than that, holding all day baby. Thank you very much for your question. I love your content. Guys, if you haven't checked out the West Desert Shooter on YouTube, I'm going to link his channel down below. Whew, you're going to love it. So while we're on an American YouTuber, I have a question here from Rickety Rambo. Yeah, Rickety Rambo. Why do you have a hint of an American accent going? I've actually addressed this earlier in a very old video of mine. My mom actually remarried. My father had cancer when I was really young. My mom remarried and she married an English guy. 
and we basically grew up sort of English so my English is a little bit different than the typical Afrikaans person who speaks English I can do that too but for me that is putting on an accent when I speak like this so this is kind of just how I speak English so I know that affects some of our South African viewers because they feel like I'm fake or whatever but this is this is how I speak anyway next last but certainly not least we're gonna jump into some questions from our patreon group so Jason from the Australian hunting podcast by the way that airs today because I would release this video on the 2nd of August so today check out Australian hunting podcast I did a podcast with Jason that's gonna be awesome I'll probably release my version of the podcast somewhere this week for you guys if you want to see me sitting talking on the phone to Australia let me know down below if you want to watch that because I haven't edited it otherwise you can just listen to his version of it yeah I think we might do that that sounds way easier for me anyway Jason asks what are the best reticles to use for long-range shooting I feel like a must-have for a reticle for long-range shooting is some sort of measuring system like we have in the EBR 7C like for example if I'm aiming at the center of something and I hit off to the side of it I want to be able to use my aiming point measured with the hash marks and the sub tensions and the steady of that reticle I want to measure where that shot impacted so I can hold over and do the difference or dial in the difference if you're dialing elevation and you hit way low because then you can actually otherwise you're guessing if you've just got a simple plex reticle you're you're essentially guessing I guess what you could do in that situation is take sort of the size of the target measure how many targets you hit low or high or over or whatever the case may be and then sort of float that crosshair somewhere in the middle and hope that you've you've measured it good what are quality muzzle brakes at an affordable price uh, I shoot the MDT lead brake it's pretty awesome I'm gonna overlay some footage of me shooting it in Namibia with the drone you can see it blasting the sand and the dust it's it's awesome basically takes off all the recoil over barrel harmonic tuners awesome or rubbish hmm not for my sport because we need uh, muzzle brakes in my sport but I do know the bench race guys are massive fans of doing this and I, when I see the groups they shoot I just want to give away all my rifles because that is something crazy anyway next question John asks hey my question is really about shooting tips for accuracy. Last year I got a Tika T3 X-Tac A1 in 223, awesome rifle by the way. With the Huxon Mod and Vortex Diamondback Tactical Scope, first focal plane, 6 to 24, great. When I took the rifle out first, I was shooting 5 inch groups at 100 yards. Last time I was out, I was shooting all over the place. But I didn't have a moderator or muzzle brake on the rifle. Moderator is a suppressor, I believe. We call them silencers. Silence! I kill you! Does a muzzle brake or moderator improve accuracy and if so by how much? Ideally I'd like to shoot steel up to 500 yards accurately and see how far I can go out from there. Can you share some of your tips for accuracy? So a muzzle brake moderator or silencer is not going to affect the accuracy of your rifle. It's going to affect the point of impact of your rifle. So if you've done load development, I'm not sure John if you're shooting factory ammunition or if you have a hand loaded for your rifle but if you've got a good if your rifles grouping let's say for example you're grouping in a half an inch at 100 yards if you then add a suppressor a moderator or a muzzle brake to that your grouping might shift over slightly to the right or a little bit up or whatever the case may be but the average size of the group should remain the same unless the muzzle brakes maybe not attached correctly so my thoughts here are if you were shooting all over the place the next time you went out something else must have changed I would go back check that your torque screws on your rifle is all correct that your rifle action is torqued correctly to the stock that your rings are torqued correctly that your rings are torqued correctly to the to the scope base and then lastly what often guys do not check is actually check if the scope base is mounted correctly of the correct torque settings to your action eliminate those and then maybe go back to the range and see if you're still all over the place if you are you might want to go to the gunsmith maybe you got some damage on your crown or something of the rifle that could also affect the accuracy of your rifle that sort of addresses that part of your question uh, with regards to long range accuracy is basically what you guys have to remember is if you can shoot a group like this at 100 yards that groups it's a cone of fire right because it's going like this out to distance so that group's gonna double to 200 and double at 
three, uh, it's gonna get incrementally bigger. Now this is sometimes what concerns me when I see guys shooting animals at extended distances. Yes, I can shoot little groups like this all day, but if I'm shooting something at a thousand meters, that means that groups like this all of a sudden. And to me, the margin of error with wind reading, the bullets in flight for a second and a half, that animal can, can walk away. Anyway, I'm digressing a little bit here, but basically you wanna get a pretty solid group at 100 yards or 100 meters, we zero at 100 meters, and uh, basically just start taking that guy out to distance. But the big important thing here is to make sure that you're applying the same fundamentals, because I often see people that can shoot pretty good groups at 100 yards, but they can't shoot targets at distance, because somewhere guys start getting intimidated by the distance. Now, if you've got good data on your rifle, the distance is literally just a number. It doesn't affect anything. You should have the same probability of hitting that target assuming there's no wind, if the target is, for example, still one MOA, and you've got the correct data for your rifle. Obviously, the wind is a, is a factor we gotta keep in mind here, but even after your first shot, you should see where that lands. If the wind doesn't change, your next one should really be on. I would try that, but process of elimination always. If your rifle's doing something funny, just tick all those boxes. It's a little bit of a checklist that you gotta run, and then make sure you're applying the perfect fundamentals to take that guy out to distance. Our next and last question comes from James Brits. And James says, how do I take my 100 meter indoor game out onto an outdoor range with scope adjustments, etc.? I ain't got no dope, James. Fantastic question. So first of all, I would watch my Strolock video that I've done quite a few years, like a year ago already, wow. And uh, that's gonna show you how to set up a good ballistic app, because a ballistic app will get you in the ballpark, okay? If you've done your speed of your rifle correctly, Okay, I've learned a little bit since I made that video, so maybe it's time we revisit that topic. But if you know the speed of your projectile ballpark, that's gonna be fine. The how high your scope is off the bore of your rifle, you input that data into your ballistic calculator with the weight of the projectile you're shooting and the correct BC for that projectile. Ideally, you wanna be using the G7 BC with the new modern boat tail bullets. That's gonna get you at the ballpark at at least 500 meters. You're gonna be close enough where you're gonna see where that's hitting. Based on that, you can chew the arc of your bullet um, and manipulate the ballistic app so those two line up, and then you should be able to start taking those out to distance. Now, having said that, if you've got a good chronograph and you know the speed, because in the last video what we did was we put in the BC and then we started playing with the speed of the muzzle velocity to chew it. But if you've got a good chronograph like a magneto speed or a lab radar, and you know the speed of your rifle is accurate, then you can actually go, Strelok has a similar function to that where you can start chewing the BC of your bullet that's gonna be specific to your rifle, and that's gonna give you a little bit better results. Anyway guys, that is it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, link down here, please subscribe, support the channel if you wanna find out more how to get stable. Maybe it's time you check out the Patreon, help me keep producing content by making it financially viable. I don't wanna make money from this, I just don't wanna lose money. Anyway guys, thank you for watching, I do appreciate it. Have a super week. Let me know if you wanna see these videos more regularly. This is actually gonna be pretty long. Maybe we need to break them up into bite-sized chunks. And what do you guys feel about doing a live Q&A video? We could hook something up like that too in the near future. Anyway, I'm babbling again. See you in the next video. Bye.